Greetings from Podcastville. The, the Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Fuji Sports. Listen, if I'm rolling, the only thing I wear is Fuji geese. That's it. And the fucking thrash cards. I love them. The Fuji geese are tougher than death. Like I said, I'm down at 285. When I'm in somebody's clothes garden, they're tugging on my fucking collar. They've tugged on it. The geese I've had before have ripped. Fuji, all they get is fingerprints. That's it. That motherfucker don't rip. So if you're a big dude, A5, A6, A4, you're looking for a great gi, go over to Fujisports.com. Take a look at that great selection, whether it's just the, the, the purple one, the lightweight purple one that's like 99 bucks, to the Separito, which is the one I wear. I love it. 139 or something like that. It's tremendous. It's lighter than hell. I got geese before that. You just got tired putting the, the thing on. It weighed 50 pounds. This is light, tough, dependable, durable. It's the way to go if you're a big guy. Now I'm down to A5, and I'm going to soon be in an A4, and I'll still be in a Fuji, whether it's an Element, a Seiko, or a Separito Gi. They're my favorites. They got mats. They got rash guards. They got shin guards. They got everything. But anyway, go to Fujisports.com right now and press in church and get it 10% off delivered to your house. You, you help us out here. Number two, you know us. If we're taking supplements, I'm taking on it. Salami was just here, and I gave him a, a shroom tech and an alpha brain. He lives off that shit. He loves it. Why? Because it works. When the product says to you, if it doesn't work, we'll give you your money back, and we don't even want the product back, you know you're working with something. And that's alpha brain. I go on my little six-week six cycles of alpha brain, and I have a great time. But listen, talk is cheap, right? Go to, go to onit.com right now. Go to supplements. If you see something you like, the, the, the protein shake, it's not the hemp horse anymore. It's Mexican chocolate. I know that. It's fucking delicious. Get the protein shake for. Anyway, go to honor.com and press in. Church. Bam. And get 10% off your order. Again, delivered right to your door. Kick this fucking mule, Lee. Greetings, you little cocksuckers. It's Monday morning. I want to talk to you about something. About 10 days ago, I got a call from Ari. He was on a plane. And uh, he was calling me to say goodbye that he was going to Australia to do a tour. And he said that he might see me in two weeks, that he got a return ticket uh, to L.A. in two weeks, just in case Mitzi Shore died. And I go, what do you mean? And he goes, yeah, she's not in good shape. She's not doing well. I hung up the phone with him, and I sat down, and, and it was weird. I haven't seen Mitzi in maybe uh, nine years, you know, ten years or something. I haven't seen Mitzi. But once he said that to me, uh, you know, I just started thinking that that whole weekend I I was in Albuquerque with Dean Delray at the Santa Ana Casino, which is great people. Uh, but just the thought of what Mitzi meant to me, you know, like at that, that whole weekend, I thought about it. Just little things about the store and stuff. And last week, we did a podcast about, you know, people who get uh, misled. They think that this is just a fucking catwalk. This will justify what I was saying last Sunday and why I'm the way I am. Uh, in 1995, I left Colorado and I, you know, went on my journey to be a comedian. Did I ever think I would end up in L.A.? Not by any means at all, guys. I thought I was going to be a ham and egger, work like that uh, southwest, uh, northern border of the country. And I was going to hide. That's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a social misfit and hide. One thing turned to the other. I ended up in Seattle. One thing turned to another. I uh, I got a call, you know, over the holidays. I went on stage, and a couple of days later, the manager of the club called me, and CBS was interested in me. So, uh, anyway, back to the Ari thing. He calls me, and he says this to me. And the whole weekend, I'm kind of thinking about my life at the store and what it meant to me, you know. And uh, if you guys Google it or whatever, there's probably a couple books on the comedy store or uh, stories about Mitch. I know there's one book that's uh, some disgruntled person wrote and called her a bitch and that they had to go on a strike to get paid from her and, you know, blah, 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 blah. blah. This is my experience with Mitchie Shore and what the comedy store meant to me. You know, in 1995, uh, I only read about the comedy store, like in Judy Carter's book and in other books or comedy magazines. But in your mind, when you first got into comedy, that was the mecca of mecca. For Catholics, it's uh, going to Rome. Rome and seeing the Vatican. For 
as a comedian, uh, the comedy store is it. That's 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 the mecca. That's the home of Kennison. That's the home of Richard Pryor. That's the home of Andrew Dice Clay. That's where Roseanne was uh, seen. That's where Welcome Back Carter was written. That's where J.J. Walker had been discovered to be on Good Times. I mean, the stories go on and on and on and on about this place and what it attracted over the years. Between you and I and Lee and, you know, uh, I never, ever, ever thought I would walk into the chambers of the comedy store, that I would ever be good enough. So it didn't matter to me whatever I heard. Like, whatever the fuck anybody said to me, I would just be Joey Diaz, take it in and blow it out and go, who gives a fuck? It doesn't matter. Like, people go, I went to the comedy store. And they're like, well, you know, they let me in for free. And I go, who gives a fuck? Or people would go, I went down there and I got on stage on open mic. Who gives a fuck? And what happened was, when you're working the rooms I was working at the time, you're working with failed comedians. You're working, not really failed comedians. You're working with headliners who had given L.A. a try. And it didn't work out for them. Now they're back home and they're pissed at people who did stay and something was going on. So you also also heard this negative undertone about Los Angeles. So it's like a, a sweet and sour situation. The whole time you're developing as a comedian, or at least for me, I wasn't developing to be on TV or developing to be the next fucking Richard Pryor. I was just doing comedy to see if it would get me away from a criminal aspect of my life I needed purpose in my life I had tried everything and comedy was the last resort <coughs> excuse me so I decided that if I was going to do comedy I was going to commit to it and I read everything I could there was no internet there was no computer and so you had to buy books and read magazines and you know everything that you read except like the Lenny Bruce shit went back, to, yeah, I think even the Lenny Bruce stuff went back to the comedy store. So, I'm living in Colorado, I'm having all these problems, I get in my car and I go to Seattle. Again, guys, when I landed in Seattle, in my heart, I wasn't good enough to be there. You know, I had been, for 20 years, nothing positive happened in my life. Nothing, nothing. You know, I got married, I went to prison, shit like that, but it, it still was not what I was searching for. I don't know what the fuck I was searching for, but none of that that had happened had mattered at that point. I was still a waste piece of shit in my mind. I moved to Seattle, and in Seattle, guess what? I started making strides as a comedian. And what do I mean? What are you, were you getting on TV, Joe? Were you making money? I was making $800 a month on an average. And uh, my bills were like... 1800 a month and if it wasn't for people like carola and josh wolf who helped me out a lot and i wouldn't have made it you know but because i committed to the journey the universe takes care of you when you commit to a journey the universe will take care of you you'll find a way and even if you suffer one night and have to sleep out in the snow six of those nights one way or another you'll sleep on somebody's couch which at that time is the ritz carlton to you the universe has a weird way of taking care of you once it knows that you're committed to what you're doing. So I'm in Seattle. I'm getting arrested for this stolen cause, domestic violence. You know, it just didn't stop with my life. And I'm not going to tell you that life was throwing curveballs at me at the time. I was the fucking problem. I was the problem. Between that and the drugs, you know, I didn't have control. The only thing I had control of was the comedy. That's the only thing I had definite control over was the amount that I got on stage, writing, getting gigs, hustling. I was dynamite at that stuff. Everything else, I was a fucking failure. Everything else, I was a failure. So one Thanksgiving, I get on stage, and again, the manager calls me a week later. And he goes, listen, some guy just called from CBS. They're doing a pilot, and you're perfect. They're coming up the second week of December to bring the whole staff to see you. That was fucking rare, guys. That was rare. Like, for a guy like me that's a criminal and shit, are you fucking kidding me? Did they see you somewhere, or what happened? They saw me at the underground. The guy went home to visit his parents. 
for the holidays. And the guy saw me on a Wednesday night in the underground, like one of those holiday comedy shows. Jesus. Me, Josh Wolf, Tana Manu, uh, Brody Stevens, Gavin Boyd. It was like 10 of us that would get together and do a show. Count Hopkins the third, you know, and then we'd get like a headliner to come in and we'd do this show. Well, the guy saw me. And his big question was if I spoke Spanish, yes. Then he brought like three people back up there. I got two things out of that club. I pulled two L.A. things out of that club where they flew me into L.A. and I did stuff and then I went back. One time they flew me in and I was so poor I cashed in the ticket and I drove down here like an asshole that I am. I pulled the Lee and drove down here. <laughs> And snorted the money and went from to that, Seattle. Yeah. Oh my God. And I went to that Japanese restaurant right around the corner, which is the worst restaurant in the world, where they sing on the tables. Right. Yeah. The sushi place. I, I went there with two other fucking morons. And but the first time I came down, I went to the Laugh Factory. I didn't even think of going to the comedy store. Didn't even think of going to the comedy store. And I didn't. But you knew about it. I knew about it. I knew at that time. By 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 ninety seven, I had read the Kennison biography, and it talked all about the power of the comedy store. And I had seen something else or read something else about Bill Hicks, and everybody's paths had to cross to the comedy store. I knew that for one of his last specials, Richard Pryor worked on the comedy store, and since I was from Denver, I also knew that Roseanne had done something that no woman had ever done. She was a she became a paid regular and Mitzi saw her in the original room, put her in the main room, and then she got the Tonight Show. Like she went from being a fucking slob to this thing overnight. Really, seriously. Oh, that's crazy. I didn't know that. Yeah. Mitzi saw her in the original room, told her to go up in the main room, and she got what and the next night she was on the Tonight Show. Or two oh, days shit. later or a week later. So I had already known the power of the comedy store. But in my mind, I'd, I'd never be good enough anyway. And, then, and all the comedians I spoke to, those headliners that didn't have anything going on that were like angry headliners, they were putting down the comedy store. Like, oh, you don't need to go up there. There are yeah, losers there. Yeah, they're not going to put you up. You got to be this. You got to be that. All this shit. I didn't listen because I didn't care, Lee. It didn't matter. I was happy doing spots at the Comedy Underground in Seattle. What did I give a fuck about the Comedy Store, the Laugh Factory, or the Improv? Well, to me, that was another world. It shows how important every set is. Like you can never look down on a set. No. And it's a, like a set's a set. If you're getting, if you're getting stuff for LA in Seattle, like that blows my mind that someone in Seattle twice would went see you holidays, bring you down. Went to the holidays to see their family. Saw me on stage, and the second one was Jeff Valdez. So the first year was Jeff Valdez for the Latino Comedy Festival, and they didn't give it to me. That's the year Greg Giraldo became a star. And then the next year, they approached me again for the Latino Laugh Factor uh, Festival, and CBS approached me. So I moved down here. I, I didn't think of moving down here. CBS was going to give me enough money to get a hotel for three weeks, rent a car, and be able to go to, there was no Uber then, there was no, you know, and I was going to be able to go to rehearsal and shoot the pilot. Holy shit. It was going to be three weeks. That's a lot of money. So I came down here, I lived in a trailer with my girlfriend, and it was the weirdest thing because I had worked New Year's with Stanhope. That New Year's, that like the 27th through New Year's, I did like six shows with Stanhope. And I knew Doug from 1991. And Doug had seen me then, and now Doug was watching me featuring for him. And he kept bugging me, you need to move to L.A. You really do need to move to L.A. They have Latino night on Sunday night at the, at the Improv. They got one at the county store. They got one at the Laugh Factory. Not only that, you'll get spots anyway. And Did I'm like, but what about what everybody else is saying? They're saying you can't get spots. He's like, fuck those losers. You can get spots. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm dirty. Fuck it. Don't worry about it. You'll get spots. So between Doug Stanhope in my ear, the CBS thing, I agreed to the CBS thing, and I drove down here with a girl in a trailer with a car behind us. And the trailer broke in San Francisco. 
And we spent five days in San Francisco, and I got on stage every night in San Francisco, so it didn't really matter. Well, we ended up landing here on a Monday. We came into L.A. When we saw L.A., the 101 South, I, I can't describe the feeling to you. Like, I can't describe the feeling to you. Like, when we were still an hour out, we were in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic. And then we pulled off. We got into Hollywood. We got onto the Sunset Strip. And on Fairview, Fairfax Boulevard, we made a right. And we pulled our trailer right there. Where you go up to Laurel Canyon and make a left. Right. Laurel, right there, we pulled up. And we loosened up our car. And we both took showers in the trailer. We got dressed. And we went to where you're going tomorrow night. What's the name of the place you're going tomorrow night? Oh, the Sycamore Tavern? That used to be Acapulco in 1997. And we went there for dinner. We thought it was like fucking the restaurant of the year. If I had $300 on me, I had a lot of money on me. Lee. I had no money when I moved down here. If it wasn't for that girl driving the whole fucking thing, I would have never got down here. Like, can you explain? Like, I want to go back just a, a little bit. To what you said about the sign for the 101. Like, what do you think? Like, when you, Do you think you finally started believing in yourself? Or like, what do you think happened? When that I saw the sign, I realized that this was real. I started doing comedy in 1991. But for two years, it was throwaway years. I, was, I wasn't even doing comedy. I was doing an impersonation, an impersonation, an impersonation. And then I understood what it took to become a comedian. So I had two, yeah, I've been doing comedy for 27 years, but it's really 25 years. Because my first two years, I got on stage like eight times. I was just bullshitting people and bullshitting myself. But I really can't say that because the second year I had a job. I had a job, a house and scene, I got on stage every week. But I still wasn't serious about it. I was just blowing smoke up my ass. I was just addicted to coke. Once 94, 95 came along, I got serious about it. And by 95, I was very serious about it. Like, I was down. I was in. This is what I wanted to do. I don't know. I'm not saying I'm going to be the next fucking Richard Pryor or the next Sam Kennison. All I'm saying is that for right now, this is what I want to do. I wasn't going to give myself high hopes and then be let down like I'm not ever going to be on TV. I knew I was never going to be on TV. I'm not an actor. Even though you're coming down for a TV show. Even that, by that time, I was like, this is crazy. As soon as I get to L.A., I got to find that acting coach. And I remember acting, asking the executive producers of the show, like, do you guys, can you, you know, I was like a little half a fag. And I'm like, can you guys recommend an acting coach to work with me before I shoot the pilot? And they're like, oh, yes, we have brilliant acting coaches, you know. Da, 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 da. <laughs> so as soon as I got here on a Monday, I went to Acapulco. I changed, took a shower. We went to the Acapulco All You Could Eat, and I headed up to the comedy store. I don't know what possessed me. I took that girl, and we walked into the comedy store. And they stopped me in the front, and I said, I'm a comic. And they said, okay. In those days, there was no really a lot of security. Monday nights, it was either Harris, Pete, or Chewy. And I walked around the back, and... They let me sit, and, and Don Barris was on stage. The first time I was, I was walking into the comedy store. I saw the star of The Last Dragon and Eddie Griffin walking out. And I shit my pants. <laughs> like, I had seen Eddie Griffin in a Bruce Willis movie, and I had saw, seen him on something he did on BET or HBO or something where he was hilarious. And here he was in front of me. At the place where you're going. And I walk in, and there's the halls with all the pictures of these great comics. And I'm just shaking my fucking head going, I don't even know why I'm here. And then there was a comic from Seattle, James Stevens III. It was open mic night. If there was 15 people in the audience, it was a lot of people. It was... Real, real audience, though? Yeah, it was 8.30 at night. There was 15 people in the audience. And Don Barris was up on stage like it was fucking Madison Square Garden with shorts on, fucking crazy than ever. And I'm like, what the fuck is this? And then as I sat there, comics came in and out, who I kind of knew, like from 
traveling. I heard their names. But then as it got later, that's when Eddie Griffin showed up and Nick DiPaolo. And I was just in fucking awe. Like, I didn't walk in the kitchen or nothing. I just stood out in the hallway. And then I met Wheels. Wheels Parisi. Yeah, he, he was there. And I go, you open for dice. Oh, my God. Like, I was fucking in complete awe. And I spoke to him for a little while. And the waitress was from Philadelphia. And her name was Eleanor, who I've had on the podcast here various times. She was the waitress from Philly, so they told me to go see her. And she gave me, like, a water or whatever the fuck they gave you in those days, a soda. And I tipped her. And that's all I knew. That was it. And I stayed out there till 12, 12.30, just talking to different comedians. And at one time, they ran out of comics. And they said, hey, man, do you want to go up? Because it was an open mic. Holy and I shit. was like, yeah. And I walked up there, and there was maybe three people in the audience, four people in the audience. And I just went up there, and when I touched the stage with my feet, I said, this is hilarious that I'm going to be able to put the comedy store on my resume and not really do a show here. But basically, I am doing a show. And I had three minutes. And everyone else told, all those negative people told you, it's impossible to get on. Get you on can't stage. get on. You never Your get first on. time there. At the comedy store, they go, do you want to get on? So I got on. There was nobody in the audience. I ate a bag of dicks, but a couple of comics came in and watched me. And they were like, you should. But the weird thing was that Every year since 1995 or 1994 to 1997 until I walked into the comedy store. Now, that night that I walked into the comedy store was January 29th, 1997. So listen to these dates correctly. And I landed on a Monday. But the funny thing about this was that for... Once a month, somebody would come up to me and look at me and go, Has Mitzi Shaw seen you yet? And I go, what, what, what the fuck is Mitzi Shaw? And they'd say, that's Paulie's mother. Wait till she sees you, dog. And I'm like, I'm, it, she's never going to see me. Because I'm never walking in there. Like, I'm never walking in there. But all directions were pushing me into the store. There was a contest in Denver in 1995. And the winner got $500 cash, and he got a a plane ticket, hotel, and a spot in front of Mitzi Shaw. Holy shit. Which was basically a Monday night spot, and you weren't guaranteed she was going to be there. It's just a bullshit contest. Oh, fuck. And I came in second. But back then, she was that well-respected. She was what? That well-respected. That you get to perform in front of Mitzi Shaw. That's pretty crazy. And that night, I came in second. But the next day comedians called up the club and said that the guy who won the contest stole the jokes. So they had to give me the $500, and I never got the plane ticket. Oh, you didn't go? I never got it from the club. They banned me for life before I got it. That sucks. Yeah, so all directions were always pointing to me to go into the comedy store. So the first week, I, I go to the comedy store, I get on stage that first night, and I go, holy shit. In my mind, I was just happy to get on stage at the comedy store. I could, I, could have, I could have told anything to anybody. I could have said to you, Lee, I went up there and there was 200 people and I killed. In the original room? Yeah, and I had to bring up Jim Carrey. It okay. wasn't the case. There was three people in there and I brought some comic up that was playing a <laughs> harmonica or some shit. You know, it wasn't like a show, show, show. <clears throat> yes, it was in the original room. And yes, it was the world famous comedy store. But I didn't go up at 8 o'clock at night. Do you know what I'm saying to you? Oh, I know exactly. I could have I could have went back to Jersey or back to Denver and told you anything I wanted to. Right. But I performed there. And Mitchie sure loved me. No, there was nobody there. But I went home that night, and I felt different. Well, I felt different. In what way? Like stronger? And I like I would I, if you, if you did decently well I would feel like you'd have a huge boner for it. No, I didn't have a boner over it, and I didn't have a. Uh, I felt like I don't know, like I maybe, maybe, maybe someday, 
in 10 or 15 years I'd get into the comedy store. That's what I felt. And that was it. And the story, that was it. The next Tuesday morning, I got up and I went to the Laugh Factory and I stood on line at 7 in the morning. And I and they made me wait there from 7 in the morning to 6 o'clock at night. Oh. And me and Gavin alternated and we would cross the street and get each other juices and shit and waters and sandwiches. But we would stand out. You had to stand on line all day. For like the next week, right? No, for just one day. Oh, okay. So that was every Tuesday. Got it. Every Tuesday, if you drove past the Laugh Factory, you see 20 people standing out there. They don't do it anymore like that. Oh, I thought they did. I guess not. I don't know. I don't know if they still do it like that. So the next morning, I got a bright eyed and bushy tail and went down there. I waited on line all day. And I heard all these fucking comedians just talking. How hard it is. What a waste of time they've been doing. That they auditioned for Spielberg and didn't get the movie. That auditions are hard. That it's tough to get an agent. It was just 20, 19 people talking bullshit. Negative. Just, just garbage. Like, if you're here, he'll never make you a regular. We're just wasting our time. Like, just, just... It was just dumb fucking chatter. And there was one guy in particular who wouldn't shut the fuck up. He had a weird accent. He wouldn't shut the fuck up. He knew everything about everything. He was an encyclopedia of fucking comedy. He knew what time Mitzi Shaw got there, what time Mitzi Shaw left, when to go to the improv, when Bud Friedman was going to be there to pass you. He knew everything, Lee. And then we got our numbers at 6 o'clock. 8 o'clock came. It was time for everybody to go on stage. And the guy went up there. And not only did he eat the biggest bag of dicks I've ever seen somebody eat, <laughs> but he went from being this loud, obnoxious guy like me to talking like a little fucking mouse. And when he got off, I looked him right in the face. I go, all day, all fucking day, you talked all that shit all fucking day. And you got on stage like a fucking hermit. I thought, he were, I thought we were going to fist fight. That's how crazy I still was then. It upset I'm you like, that you much f- that you listened to him all day. All fucking day, he didn't shut the fuck up. But then he goes up there and he becomes Joe Hermit. Anyway, I'm number eight on the list. I go up there, I do my dirty material. You got to wait around to get critique from Jamie. And as soon as I sat down, Jamie goes, listen, I'm going to give you the best advice I can give you. Pack your bag and move to Las Vegas. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, you're a club comic. He goes, if you move to Las Vegas and start in one of those rooms right now, in five years, everybody will know who you are. But you're not going to do anything in L.A. You're too old. You're too dirty. You're never going to do nothing here. You can't pass in my club. I was like, Jesus Christ. This is crazy. This is crazy. So I said, you know what? It doesn't matter because I'm just going to shoot the pilot and go back to Colorado and try to be a dad or end up killing this woman. <laughs> you know? I had no options. I had no real options. So I, it, I woke up the next morning and I went to, uh, I think it's 6565 Sunset Boulevard, something like that. And they have telemarketing jobs, like three or four floors of different telemarketing jobs. Like the, and it's all automated. So I walked in there and I had done telemarketing before, but never automated where you make 80 calls an hour. It's just constant. You know what I'm saying? Like, as soon as you get a hang-up, it's constant. I wasn't used to that. The building is still there, and they still do telemarketing. It's a beautiful building on Sunset. They redid it. But on the walk home, I bumped into this black dude, and we were just talking generalities. And he told me he was a manager at a telemarketing room where people were making eight to 1500 a week selling cigars on the phone. And that was a little more money than you were making? It was a lot more money than I had made in fucking three or four years. Like, I was making no money. and I didn't make a dime in 95, 96, 97. Huh? Now they were giving me money to move down here. But by that time, I owed money. I owed back child support. I owed a thousand things. I bought some Coke. I had to buy some clothes. So that money disappeared. So me and the girl got into a fight. Not only did Jamie Masada fucking tell me I sucked, 
but the girl threw me out of her fucking car. So now I had to live with Doug Stanhope on the top bunk. He bought bunk beds in his apartment because he was dating a girl from a TV show then. So he would never spend the night at his house. So he, he had a bedroom and he had bunk beds in his living room with a TV and a typewriter out there. So if you wanted to write jokes, you could write jokes. If you wanted to sleep, you could sleep. So at that time, it was me and one of his fucking friends that was just out of his mind named Ron. Ron was on the Doug Stanhope's going to be a star boat. He was Doug's security. He was Doug. He played like Doug's security. But he was just a big guy. You know, he didn't know nothing about mm -hmm. nothing. You know, at that time, 1997, Doug Stanhope was making a big bang in Hollywood. And here I am living with Doug, and I'm selling cigars in the fucking daytime. Like, I'm waking up in the mornings at 6, going over there, and I would sell cigars, like, from fucking 7 in the morning to fucking 12 or 1 in the afternoon every day. It was rough, and I started, me and Josh Wolf, we would go to a place, you know, Barham? Right, yeah. Off Burbank there, there was an open mic there every night. There was a coffee shop, uh, you know where I am. Uh, what's the taco place that we go to over here? Cactus. Cactus across the street from the cactus, where the the children's is a place in there where children's play. I don't know. That used to be a coffee shop, and that was a, a big time open mic during the day. At night. Okay. It was a coffee shop all day, but at night it became a comedy room. Oh shit! Okay. And then there was a steak place in the valley. The something steakhouse up in the valley, and they had a back room, and they did comedy. So for those, you know, for my first two weeks here, I did what you're doing now here. I started from scratch. Like, I had already been insulted by fucking, what's his name? But Sunday nights was Latino night at the Improv. And I got a hold of that guy, and he said, I'll give you a five-minute guest set. And he goes, I want you to come back next week. Well, I, want, well, I want you to wear a tuxedo or a suit. Jesus. His what? name was John Mercedes. Why did he want you to wear a suit? Because he said he didn't mind if I worked dirty as long as I wore a suit. So John Mercedes was basically putting me on stage on Sundays at the Improv. Remember I told you people would say you're not going to get on stage in this town? And you're on two out of the three. So, so already I'm at the Improv on a Sunday night. And I'm here about two weeks. I got a job selling cigars. Josh Wolf is living on uh, Vista. Ralphie May wasn't here yet. At this time, Ralphie May was not here. I was sleeping on Stanhope's couch on his bunk bed. Ron was on the bottom bunk bed. And at night, we just got together. Whoever you just got together, like when you do with Sean and for, and we would just go from open mic to open mic, smoking pot. You know, one place gave you a drink ticket. But there was this cat named Rudy Moreno, who I had on the show years ago. And he booked a room on Fridays and Saturdays called The Brave Bull. And everybody said, you got to get on stage down there. But fucking Rudy. I called Rudy 80 times, bro. I called him every day, spoke Spanish. He would never call me back. So one Friday, I got directions. I got in the car, and I fucking went down there. And I said, who's Rudy Moreno? And they go, that guy there. And I walked up to him. I go, Rudy Moreno, I'm Joe Diaz. What, you can't call me back? And he's like, I'm sorry, I'm busy. I can give you five minutes and shit. And I went up there and I became friends with Rudy. So now I was already doing spots on the weekend. Rudy told me, come back next weekend. It was $25 a spot. That's 50 fucking bucks, guys. 50 bucks in those days, guys. You have no idea what I'd do with 50 bucks in those days. You have no idea. In cash. In cash. So, in this time, I realized CBS doesn't know what they're going to do. CBS doesn't know if they're going to shoot me for the pilot or save me for uh, seven episodes. Wait, or you were definitely going to be on the show. Yeah, I'm definitely on the show. I'm a crucial part of the show. You feel like everything is coming together? Uh, no. I didn't really know. I didn't know what was going on. This so you were able was, to keep it level-headed. This was not my world. This is not my world. Okay. I had already found. I was already buying coke in the building. I knew where to buy coke already. Like at that time, uh, Josh Wolf's brother's friend in the building sold coke, so we were already getting coke. 
I'm here about two weeks, two and a half weeks. And I'm already getting on stage at the improv and I'm already getting on stage, whatever. But the first time I came to a showcase for Latino Laugh Festival, I met a girl there. A woman who looked kind of like you, five foot two, 300 pounds. She just had a, like a, a fucking shower curtain over her as a dress. Like she was just a little short, fat little Mexican chick. And her name was Marilyn Martinez. And she watched me go up. And she said, hey man, has Mitzi Shaw seen you yet? And I go, would you stop with that? She goes, ah, Mitzi's gonna fucking love you, man. So I'm talking with Doug Stanhope one day and I leave and I go to do an open mic. And who do I bump into? But Marilyn. And she goes, did you move here? And I go, yeah. And she goes, did you put yourself on the showcase list for Mitzi yet? And I go, no, I don't know if I'm going to stay here. I'm here shooting a pilot. Blah, 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 blah. She goes, listen, I'm going to call Scott Day tomorrow. Scott Day was the talent coordinator. She goes, I'm a, I'm a regular there. I'm going to get you a showcase spot there. I didn't know what to say. Like, it was I, a trick? I, just, I just told you that the universe takes care of them. Of, of, of you when they know you're committed to what you're doing. I, I didn't know what to say. At this point in my life, guys, I'm, I'm, I'm 30 fucking four years old, 33 years old. I, I was in prison. I, I just, you guys have no idea what I was going through at that time. And here I am becoming this comedian. And here I get this deal from CBS and they give me a little bit of money. And in one of those Latino nights, a little bald guy comes up to me and he goes, how you doing? My name is blah, 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 blah. And I'm an agent of Sutton, Bart and Minari. We do commercials. Do you have a commercial audition? I'm uh, an agent? And I go, no. And he goes, would you like to sign with us? And I'm like, yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't know nothing about nothing, guys. Absolutely, I do. The next day I find out Sutton, Bart and Minari at the time was the best commercial agent in the fucking land. Oh, shit. Like, I had just signed with the best commercial agent in the fucking land. It's like getting here and signing with... I'm like, what the fuck yeah. are you talking about? And he goes, yeah, we're going to get you out for commercials and voiceovers. I went and did contract. And then John Mercedes introduced me to a dude. <coughs> introduced me to a dude that was a manager. And he was Carrot Top's manager for a while. And he goes... You want to talk to him? I go, yeah. He goes, he wants to talk to you. He goes, you're a character. We talked for a few weeks. But in this whole time, that night, I see Marilyn, and Marilyn tells me. This all goes down at the improv, but Marilyn tells me, because she's there for Latino night, that she's going to get up tomorrow morning and call Scott Day. So I go home floating on fucking, you know, clouds. But in the back of my mind, it really doesn't matter, because... People showcase for her all the time. She gets off on turning people down. Everyone, like, it seems like a lot of people have stories about it taking a long time for yeah. them to get past. So it, I'm like, even if I showcase, it doesn't matter because I'm not going to stay here. Like, this is just a fucking vacation for a few weeks. I'm a fucking father. I got to go back to Colorado, try to fucking see my kid and go to war with this bitch. <sighs> Even though I'm fucking poor, I'm living in car, whatever the fuck, I'm standing on Dan, Doug Stanhope's fucking couch, whatever the fuck I was doing at that time. That next morning, when I wake up, it's Monday morning, and I go to a little cigar job. When I come back, Doug Stanhope is in the living room, and he's typing, he's talking to Fat Run, God rest his soul. And that's when he says to me, hey, man, I called Scott Day today. So Scott Day got two calls? Two calls. He goes, I called Scott Day today and told him to make you a regular at the store for you to showcase. You need a regular to back you. He goes to call him up during the week. Call him up later on during the week and he'll schedule for a showcase. So right now I got the greatest comic in the land and Marilyn Martinez calling Scott Day. I never met Scott Day. I don't know what the fuck Scott Day looks like. I don't know nothing. Now, the next one, guys, is really going to throw you for a fucking loop. I go to a show at the Improv on a Wednesday night. 
and who do I bump into right after that whole thing on Monday with Marilyn and now at this time I had gotten my first spot at the improv the talent coordinator Richard Cooper his window used to be you could see the window still he would sit there at night with the window open and watch you and he watched me on Latino night and he came down and told me to call in for spots during the week so I wasn't doing too bad I'm not going to tell you I was struggling. I, no, I, I was struggling. I, I really was struggling. But fuck, I'm here three weeks. I'm getting spots at the improv. I got a commercial agent. I got a job that makes okay money. I'm snorting a little coke. Me and the girl are on the rocks. Me and my daughter are on the rocks. Me and my ex-wife are on the rocks. I mean, my sh everything around me was shit, except this comedy fucking thing. Except this fucking comedy thing, which was the biggest long shot in the fucking world for a guy like me. Guess who I bump into the improv that night on a Wednesday night, guys, when I go down there? Who? About a year ago, I put somebody on the podcast and I got questioned by everybody. I got questioned by so many fucking people on my decision why I put this guy on the podcast. And you're going to realize why I put him on the podcast when I tell you who I bumped into. Guess who I bumped into that night? Can I guess? Yes. Carlos? Carlos Mencia. And he came up to me and he gave me a hug. And he goes, how long have you been in town? I told him three weeks that I'm trying to be a regular at the store. And he goes, you know what? I'll call Scott Day for you tomorrow. Now you understand why I put Carlos on the podcast. Because before I found out Carlos was a thief or anything, this was way before I met Joe Rogan, three people vouched for me at the comedy store. All right? So now it's Thursday, and my pager goes off, and it's 323 number, 656. I call it back, and it's the comedy store. And I go, this is Joe Diaz. Somebody called me from the comedy store. And they're like, hold on one second. And the phone picks up, and it's Scott Day. And he goes, Joey Diaz, yeah, Scott Day. Now, he was a f right, off, right off the bat, like that first conversation. It wasn't like it didn't mean the world to me. Like, it was like, Joey Diaz, yeah, Scott Day, talent coordinator. I've had a few people call in here for you. I'm going to put you on the showcase list. But the bad news is it's going to take six months. Because there's that many people who want to showcase for Mitzi. Yeah, it's a six-month waiting list. Fuck. So what do I go? I go, thank you very much. You know, thanks for calling me. And he goes, yeah, so it's February. You'll be hearing from us like in fucking September. And what did what part of you is upset? Or were you just thinking this is no part of the parts path? of me upset? No, none of no me. parts of me upset because right now that gives me six months to prepare. That's true. That gives me six months to fucking prepare for the killer of killers. So I'm gonna finish this fucking pilot. I'm gonna take whatever money they have to me, whatever they're gonna give me. Like they're gonna give me scale for two days at the end of shooting. Three days is twenty one hundred dollars or something like that. And I was gonna go back to Colorado and start a new life. This is right there. Thursday, 2 in the afternoon, I'm shooting the following fucking Monday, Tuesday and Wednesday, and I'm going to leave here with a showcase for Mitzi Shaw in fucking September. I got six months to work on whatever minute she wants. I don't even know how many minutes she wants, okay? I hang up with Scott Day, and about three hours later, I get a fucking call from the pilot people, and they go, listen, you're shooting tomorrow. One scene for the pilot, and then you're done. Your call time is 9.15 uh, CBS Radford. I knew nothing, Lee. I knew fucking nothing. You'd been th here three weeks. You didn't know like what the I studio knew was? Or? I know nothing. They gave me a zip code at that time and a fucking street number, and I asked around, and thank God Josh Wolf had been here like two months before me. He went on meetings. He told me where to go. I think it was Josh who drove me. Like, somebody had to blend me their car or something like that. Fuck. I got a ride from somebody, and then I took, like, a bus back. But I went up there at 8 in the morning. They, they did the fitting that day. And basically, dog, my role, like, after they saw me and looked at me and, and talked to me, like, they fucking hated me. But they had spent the money on me already. So now they put me in the show. Like, when I read for it and rehearsed with them, I had, like, two scripts, but I was so bad of an actor or so such a piece of shit that I was 
that dad cut me down to two lines, Lee and the pilot. Like, what are you having, Nick? The usual? A beer on ice? Ha, 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 and I giggle or something stupid. Like, two cops come in. When I first got the script, it was two cops come in, and then I ask them that shit, and then we go through, like, a monologue of peace, like, listen, we all know what this is. We pay you every week. You let us know who comes in here and gives us the information. So I was playing like a bartender type rat to prosecutors. And it wasn't going well. When I got the script, I had a fucking huge role in this. Right. But after rehearsing with them two or three times, they saw I wasn't a fucking actor. That I was green like a motherfucker. That I could barely, I knew nothing. Like guys, I knew nothing. And at that time, I hunted around, and I, and I found the guy on a Monday who coached me on that, and I liked him. His, friend, his name was Frank Magna. Look at that. I still remember his name. He coached me for like 20 bucks an hour, and I went down, and I still stunk. Like, I, I just stunk, guys. Are you want me to lie to you and tell you I was Olivier? I still stink as an actor. I just use stand-up as my backup, but I'm no actor. So I'm not, I'm not ashamed of telling you people this story because I never really told you this story. When I got the pilot, when I first got the script, I had two or three pages of monologue on one scene and two pages of monologue on another. I rehearsed it with them. They went back and forth. I didn't know shit. I think on one of the rehearsals, I was high from the night before. So when I got to the pilot, they just they shut me down to two lines. I went up to CBS Radford. I found out right where it was. I went up there. I did the costume fitting. They hated me so much, they shot me out first. Jesus. All right. I was just thinking about this because I, I, I didn't remember the whole story until last week when I really, really thought about what really fucking happened. I think I made up a lie just to tell. I don't know what I did, but that's what really happened. By the time I shot, they were like, you're done. I got out of there, all right? And I took a bus back to Hollywood, okay? And I remember I did the paperwork, and I asked the lady, do I get paid today? And she's like, no, you get paid in 10 to 14 days. So I'm like, fuck, fuck. Now I got to wait two more weeks and sleep on Doug Stanhope's. Doug Stanhope wasn't mad at me or anything. I just didn't want to be here. And that's it. I'm getting a showcase in six months. I did my spots. I'm a regular at the improv. When I come back, Latino night will be bigger than ever. And this is how it'll work out. My page goes off. It's about 5.30 in the afternoon. And I'm standing in Doug Stanhope's living room by myself and my pager goes off and it's the comedy store and I call him back and I go this is Joe Diaz did somebody call me and like yeah hold on Scott Day and Scott Day goes Joey are you available this Sunday to showcase for Mitzi Shaw and I go well, you said six months and he goes no 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 I had two or three fallouts can you can you do it this Sunday and I go yeah I'll be there and that was it Lee I hung up the phone, and it was that easy. I wasn't even here a month. And I was showcasing for Mitzi Shaw. <laughs> now, for fucking seven years, I heard nothing but negativity. Nothing but negativity. Right. Nothing. You'll never get on. Ba 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 ba. Right then and there, I remember fucking hanging up that phone and just going, what the fuck is going on? But right then and there, I thought about what I had been going through all those years and how I was doing comedy through it. Like, at the worst that I ever got, I still pushed and I still kept... Like, no... I can't tell you how bad I was feeling when I would drop that little girl off on Wednesdays at 7. I can never describe to you how bad I would feel leaving her to another man with my ex-wife. But I would immediately get in my car and force myself to do comedy and turn that anger and rage into funniness to cover me at least for an hour to make me feel good. Like, 
that's what that showcase meant to me. Like, I was like, okay, all that shit paid off. But the only reason you were leaving L.A. then, before this phone call, was to go back to your daughter in Colorado? Was I was going to go home and just, who the fuck was I? Who am I kidding? Because you, you said everything was going so well. I'm, I'm, but it didn't matter. I was going to fuck it up. I was going to fuck it up somewhere. I already fucked it up, Lee. I just fucked it up. Instead of getting a fucking acting coach when I got down here and working with him for three days in a row, I stood online and I talked to people at, at coffee shops instead of getting an acting coach like I was supposed to do. I didn't do that. I got him for one afternoon and I went in there acting like fucking Da Vinci and I ended up blowing it. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't matter today, but it mattered then with, 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 with what was going on in my life. Like, I felt shittier and shittier. Now you're trying to tell me I got a showcase for this fucking lady on Sunday? So what are the odds of me getting passed with all the bad shit that's happening? Not very good, Paul. So I'm like, wait a second. They didn't wait me on the pilot. This guy at the Laugh Factory told me I was basically a fucking ham, a bum. The improv, the guy must be drinking. (laughs) <laughs> you know, the guy must be fucking, he, mu- he must feel good for handicapped kids or something. Why am I getting spots when for seven years all I heard was negativity? All I heard was fucking negativity. Why would she give me a fucking spot? Why would she give me a fucking showcase? So I hung up that fucking phone with Doug Stanhope and I went everywhere. I remember there was, a, there was an open mic like on Santa Monica towards the 101. Like that's a bad neighborhood back there. I still remember going there and standing in the back of the room and just going on stage and bombing that night in front of a bunch of comics going, how am I going to fucking pass in front of Mitzi Shaw? But, like, you were preparing for the The show, yeah, oh yeah. I fucking stayed up one night sober and wrote. I fucking got my best three minutes together that I ever, ever, ever had. I polished them backwards. I knew the material backwards and forwards. You had three minutes. And, and for you people, had three fucking minutes. That's not a lot. Like, it sounds like a lot of time when people say, oh, you do a five-minute open mic when you've never done one before. It sounds scary. But three minutes is not that much time. Three fucking minutes I had in front of the lady who fucking could call your life right now with one fuck. This is, you know, going up in front of Mitzi is like fucking meeting Carlo Gambino in my world. Like, that's what it was then. Like, not only am I going to get to meet her, but I'm going to go up in front of her, and she's going to turn me down anyway. And now I'm really going to be fucking crushed. I was going to say, what what did you imagine what would happen? That I was going to get knocked down. But I said, fuck it. If I go down, let me go down in flames. So I did every open mic I fucking could in town. For every fourth wall that you guys know of locally, I fucking did in those two days. When I went in there Sunday night at 7 o'clock, I was prepared. I was shit in a pickle. I wore, like, a dress shirt. I wore my jeans. I wore my sneakers. You know, I was 33 years old, and I was about to put everything on the fucking line. Like, this was going to be the decisive moment in my life. And guess what? I walked up there with zero confidence. Like, Even after all those open mics? Lee, you have no idea what the comedy store represented at that time for a comic of my caliber. This was the White House. This is it. If You know what I'm saying? Like, this was everything I had. Like, this was... And, and here I am doing comedy on paper six years. I'm like, this isn't fucking happening. This isn't happening. I don't have a manager. I don't, you know, this isn't happening. But I still went down there. And I remember I was scared shitless. I went down there with this girlfriend of mine and one of my friends from Seattle. And I was scared shitless. I think Josh Wolf came down there with me. And I sat, I walked up. And when I walked up, she was sitting there already. And we made eye contact, and she smiled. And I smiled, and I sat down. I, you know, I'd never been known to be a kiss-ass like that or anything. I just sat down in the corner, 
And then I went up to the booth and I said, my name is Joey Diaz. And they pointed me in the direction of the host. I think the host that night was Freddie Soto, God rest his soul. And I went up to Freddie and I go, Freddie, I'm Joey Diaz. And Marilyn was there. Oh, they came to watch for your set? Marilyn was there. Doug Stanhope was there. They all came down there. And I was pacing. I was nervous. I was like number eight or nine on the list and mm. shit. Thank God you went first. Yeah, some, it was something crazy. Like, something crazy. And I still remember them going, you're next. And, like, you know, your whole life. Like, I saw myself in prison. I saw my mother's grave. I, I thought about me getting a GED. I thought about me fucking dropping out of high school. I, thought, I just thought about every negative thing that could happen in my life. Like, nothing positive came into my mind at that moment. Like, nothing. Nothing, Lee. Like, nothing. I'm going to go up there. I'm going to do this. She's going to tell me to go fuck myself. And I'm going to go back to Stanhope's way for my check and go back to Colorado and just do local comedy and do fucking radio gigs and shit like that. I already had an escape plan. I went up there, and as I was getting ready to go on stage, Eddie Griffin came and sat next to her. Now, the night I went on stage, that Monday night, when I first came to town, I bumped into Eddie Griffin, but Eddie Griffin didn't leave. He was in the back of the room talking loud while I was on stage, but he watched me. So when Eddie Griffin saw me showcasing for Mitzi, he sat next to Mitzi, and he didn't really let anybody talk to Mitzi because that's a secret. God rest the soul of showcasing for Mitzi was surrounding her so nobody could talk to her while you were on stage. Because she would not pass you if she didn't see you. But she wouldn't make, she wouldn't, like, she wouldn't stop people from interrupting her? She would talk to them? Dog, everybody wanted to kiss her ring. Everybody wanted to kiss her ring. So as soon as she sat in that edge chair, everybody would come in her direction. Waitresses, managers, comics, future comics, open micers. I mean, fucking everybody. She was like Dana White. Like, she was that powerful. She could change your life. It was like that contest, like uh, the Ultimate Fighter. You know what I'm saying? It was like that. Like, she's the fucking host of the Ultimate Fighter. And I went up there and I, I mentioned something about being Cuban. And. I did okay, Lee, I guess. And when I walked past her, she grabbed my hand, and she smiled, and she goes, can you come back next week and do 10 minutes? Oh, my God. And I go, yes. And she goes, you were very funny or something like that. And that was it, bro. Like, I was like, oh, my God. And then people were like, well, that's what she loves to do, make you come back and then tell you no. So now I had to live another week. Of torturing yourself. Of torturing myself and doubting myself that I was going to eat shit. But again, I went out every night and I did a fucking spot and I did a couple spots and then I was introduced to Felipe, a guy by the name of Felipe and Willie Barcena, one of those Latino nights. And they would give me Tuesday and Wednesday nights. They gave me that first Tuesday and Wednesday night and they paid me $40 with a burrito each night. Oh, sure. $40 in those days was a lot of fucking money, Lee. $40 for one show. So I would do like two open mics and then get in the car and shoot down to Felipe's room and pick up 40 bucks. And that whole week, I didn't go to the store. I didn't hang out at the store. I wasn't one of those guys at all. I just went. I think I got a, a, an improv spot that week. I worked hard for the 10-minute showcase. I'm not asking you to do it, but do you remember that 10 minutes? Not even close. Really? Okay, I didn't know if you had it memorized. Not even close. I know that I went off. That night I went down there, and I was turning 34 years old. The night I had to do 10 minutes was my birthday, February 19th. Shit. I wasn't even here a month. I got to town January 29th. And it was February 19th, and I was doing 10 minutes for Mitzi. On your birthday? My mother died. I quit high school. 
I ran from the law. I robbed people. I went, you know, I got locked up. I got married, divorced. I had a kid. I got a yank from me because I was basically a fucking loser. And I was 34 fucking years old with no direction. No direction. Like, this was all a gamble up to this night. My whole life had been thrown away up to this night. That's how I had to really think about it. Like, if she makes me a fucking regular, what next? Like, it took me two years, 18 months to get on stage. I was so scared of getting on stage. Do you know why, Lee? No. Because I feared that night. Of being, like, a good comedian? Yes, I feared exactly what was happening. I feared it. I was scared that my life was going to change. That's freaky. Did you want it to change? Oh, my God, in the worst way. In the worst way, I wanted my life to change, Lee. I couldn't live like that no more. I was just a fucking disaster. I I had become everything my mother didn't want me to become. Do you know what that feels like? She wouldn't have liked you being a comedian? I'm not saying that. But up to the age of 34, I, I had no fucking direction. Every move I had made was wrong. How fucking pathetic is that? The move I was scared to make that was going to change my life. And I knew it. I knew it for 18 months. I knew it if I get on stage, something good might happen. But I would go, no, nothing good's going to happen. I was so fucking scared. And here I was on my 34th birthday showcasing for fucking Mitzi Shaw. It's it's a it, it was fucking surreal. It was fucking surreal. It was like when my mother died for two or three weeks. When somebody dies, you think it's a dream. For like a month, you walk around in shock. Your mind is really in shock. You don't really accept it. You tell your friends you're okay, but you're walking around like you got hit in the fucking head, you know. And. Here, this, that, that's how I felt like that night. Like, I'm 34 years old. I've never got it right. So this is going through your head as you're pacing? Oh, my God. About to go on stage? Yes. Sure. You're not going over your material? You're not... No. Sorry about that. No. No. Holy shit. You're not thinking about your material. You're thinking about why are you in this situation. It t- mm-hmm. I know people that have been up here for 10 years... And they can't become a regular. You know, I know people have showcased for four or five times and they're way better comics than me. Obviously, I've seen them. Fucking, they're way better than I am. And Mitty turned them the fuck I've seen them. I've seen them. They were way better comedians than I was. But there was something she liked about you and that freaked you out. It freaked me the fuck out. I went up on stage... I did my fucking 10 minutes. I got, I did eight or nine minutes because I got off as soon as I saw that light. <laughs> I didn't want to go over that light at all. That's so funny. I did like my nine minutes. I fucking did what I did on stage. And when I got off, she stopped me again and she goes, Start calling in for smarts tomorrow. You're a regular. Congratulations. Oh. At any point, did you think about the people who had told you that she was going to love you? And like they were fucking right. Yeah, yeah, it was Steve McGrew. It was just a couple certain comedians. But Steve McGrew was the guy that told me when I was 18 months in. He goes, Mitchie Shores, and I love you. That's why till today me and Steve McGrew are such good <laughs> friends, even though he's crazy on fucking Twitter. <laughs> Give me some Tony Bennett. It's Monday. So now, you know. You sit there and you reflect and you go, all right, Joey, so you got into this store after six fucking years. What the fuck are you crying about? I didn't, I'm not crying at all. I'm telling you the story of my relationship with Mitzi Shaw. 
So after she told me I was a regular, she said to me to that I should dress up like Fidel Castro and and bring a, a cigar up on stage. I mean, she was just wacky trying to throw me off. Now, let me explain something to you people. Getting to the comedy store is one thing. Staying there is another. She would kick you out? She wouldn't give you spots? I didn't say that. I said getting to the comedy store is one thing. Staying there is another. The night I got passed, she passed three other people. Those people are long gone. I see one guy once a year at Marie E.T. He's drawing pictures of some shit now. Getting there is one thing. Staying there is a complete different other picture. All it takes is her walking in one night and you're taking a bomb on stage and it could be that quick. She gets a report that you keep bombing. You, you're getting high up there. That you do, You're done. Like you stop getting spots and there's no explanation. And then people end up in the psychiatric hospital. And I'm not kidding you, Lee. Well, you have to there was remnants. See, when you go up to the comedy store now, they cleaned it up. But for years, there was remnants of comics that were still left off from the Kennison days. That was still like fucked up on blow, still waiting for the party. I mean, it was fucking sad. It was sad. So there were all these remnants of all these comics that had hung out there for years that Mitzi didn't let, that didn't make a regular, like they showcased like 13 times for her. And she never made them a regular and they still hung out up there. And it was sad. So again, Getting to the comedy store is one thing. Staying there is another. And you wanted to stay there? Now, at this time, yes. Now, at this time, the word on the street was if you got two spots a week, you were lucky. Okay? So, you had a call in for spots on Monday. So, you had seven nights to pick one. Most people didn't call in for Tuesdays because it was black night in the main room. And that meant that the parking lot would get full and white people wouldn't come to the comedy store because it was surrounded by black people. This is a true story. So on Tuesday nights, comics would call in and call Wednesday through Saturday. What happened was, as soon as I, I became a, a... As soon as I got passed at the store... A week later, they were posting for a job as telemarketers. So I applied for one of the jobs as a telemarketer in the afternoon. So I would sell cigars in the morning. And then at about one, I'd go to the comedy store. And in those days, it was me, Shayma Tash, was not, I spoke to her two nights ago. She's a comedian in Las Vegas. The manager was Enz Mitchell, who ended up buying the club on Wilshire, a comedy club on Wilshire. He was the telemarketing manager. And the other guy that worked in the room was the guy I told you from Marie E.T. that I see once a year. And in those days, our job was to call businesses and give them free tickets. That's it? I would call, like, Larry's Body Shop. How you doing? This is Joey Diaz. Uh, this is, I'm calling you from the comedy store. I want you to come out. When was the last time you went out and seen a great entertainment? And, oh, it's been three years. Come to the comedy store. Let me give you 20 tickets. They, they were giving away tickets then. Wow. So I would get a commission, and I would get, uh, like, a dollar if they showed up. The other scam was there was these getting free of the comedy store cards. That was the other scam at the comedy store. So if somebody came to the door and gave you that card with your name on it, you got a dollar on Friday. So you were supposed to give those cards out. So, no, you didn't supposed to. Who the fuck do you think you're dealing with, some asshole? I would take those fucking cars and, and take the bus to Universal City. <laughs> and I would stand in the middle and give them to tourists. And I would get 60 fucking people a night, my friend. Shit. And then on Friday and Saturday, you know what I would do? There was a line. And without the doorman seeing me, I would go to the back of the line and give away like 50 tickets. <laughs> Bro, they never figured out. They couldn't figure out how I was getting three hundred dollars a week from them. Holy shit! But but legitimately, I would take a bus to Universal City in the afternoon, 
and give away 100 cards three days in a row. It's, br it's brilliant. Just give it away to people. Here you know, you're a tourist. Kind yeah, of have, who's not going to take a free ticket? Yeah, and people would go, give me three of them, give me four of them. And once I'd finish, I'd get back on the bus, and I'd go right over the hill with whoever would let me in a car for an hour, and that's how I did it. A no, dollar a piece, yeah. A dollar a piece. I didn't fuck around. So when I was working in the telemarketing office, I would hear all the complaints upstairs. Paulie had an office upstairs. And then another guy had an office. Scott Day had an office up there. So I could listen to what was going on in Scott Day's office all day. When Mitzi would call him, when they would talk about spots. So they didn't like prima donnas. They didn't like people who called in Wednesday through Saturday. Saturday. So she wouldn't give them spots right off the bat. I figured that out right off the bat. You, you heard them talking about it. That's crazy. So I would call in Monday through Sunday. And the most prestigious spot at the store in those days was Sunday night. The early MC and the late, late MC. The early MC was 7 to 10, and the late MC was 10 to close. The guys who ran that MC room for years were like, David Letterman was a host for her. Uh, what's the guy from Full House? Oh, Saget. Bob Saget was a host there. Freddie Soto was a host for her. That was a prestigious position. And I wanted that fucking job. So the, the early host would be Bob Oshack. He's not around, but he's a dear friend. I thought I would see him this week because he's a comedy store. And the late host would be uh, Freddie Soto. So I would show, I would always make sure, I would always show up on Sundays when she was there and try to get on stage in front of her so she would see a development. And I always was honest with her. So, like, she would put me in the main room and I'd bomb and I'd see her during the week. And one time I told her, don't put me in the main room no more because I'm just bombing in there. And that was it. She made me go up every fucking time mm -hmm. at the same spot to make me bomb. You know, like she knew, you know, what Greg Jackson is to MMA, how to take a fighter and sculpt them. That's what she was to comedians. You know, uh, the next couple of weeks or what you guys saw on Twitter, uh, there was a lot of accolades about her and stuff like that. And trust me, it's the same people that talk shit about her 10 years ago. I was there with her for 10 fucking years straight. I dealt with her on a weekly fucking basis. She called me Fat Baby. She put my name, Fat Baby, on the roster. You know, I never got banned from there. I did a lot of crazy shit, even though she figured out, you know, I remember I took my dick out behind, behind Judy Cancioli one time on stage. And then I took my dick out on a Friday night with some chick. I took my dick out like three times, like in four weeks. And finally, I bumped into it. She's like, don't take your dick out no more, okay? It's quite a workplace. Oh, oh my, my God. God. It was fucking crazy. Remember, from 97 to about 2006, the asylum was run by the Invix. We ran that fucking place. Don't take your dick out anymore. Don't take your dick out anymore. Mm -hmm. But she also made me the house MC. Now, <laughs> two nights ago, you and I, she did, on Sunday nights from 10 to close which for me was a big-time honor because I knew the people who had that position before. Let me tell you something. When I first became a regular at the store, everything else in my life stopped me. You didn't go to the other spots as much? Or? I didn't go anywhere. I went, to op I went to open mics and paid rooms, but I just belonged to the comedy store. It's very weird. Nobody ever liked me. I never went to Montreal. I never do no festivals. I never got invited to anything. But that never meant anything to me. You know why? Because I was always a regular at the store. Mitzi Shaw liked me. I kept that in the back of my mind for years. When I Nobody liked me. I couldn't even get a fucking agent, Lee. I couldn't even get an agent for comedy. No comedy agent would ever fucking sign me. But she was still giving me five spots a week. So she saw something. Did she manage anybody? No. No. At that time, by the time I got to the store, 
she was getting older. She wasn't up there every night. She was only up there like two or three nights a week, but she was there every day. She was there in the daytime, Monday through Friday. And Saturdays, I think. I think she was there like six days a week. But she knew comedy. You know, like that's weird that nobody else fucking gave me any love. Nobody, guys. You know, when I tell you I didn't get n nothing. People were getting signed by Three Arts and CAA and ICM all around me, bro. And nobody, people would fucking run from me. But she kept giving me spots. But I believed it. The reason why I went to 418 was because I believed in comedy. Like, once she made me a believer, I was all in. Fuck health. Fuck everything else. It's all about being a comic. Which also gave me a green light to be dangerous. I was dangerous. I did blow every night. You know, I did promiscuous shit. I did crazy shit. You know, I met some fucking crazy people at the comedy store in the beginning. There were these black bank robbers that hung out down there. That had a front as a cell phone store in Crenshaw or fucking Compton. And I was friends with them through Eddie Griffin. And trust me, I was doing some fucking kinky shit for a few years there. I'm really fucking lucky that I never, ever, ever. I even, do you know that, okay, before I fucking was the host. After the telemarketing division closed and Enns Mitchell closed, they wanted to do something with me. I needed a day job. So Bob Oshak was the driver five days a week. He wanted to be a writer, so he gave me the job two days a week. So on Wednesdays and Fridays, I was a driver there at the comedy store. You know that, right? For who? For any whatever they needed. I would have to go to the hardware store and pick up materials. Oh, okay. I would have to pick up a tongue sandwich from Mitzi Ooh. at the, the one Jewish deli and bring it to a house and drop it off and give it to the maid. That was her favorite lunch? She would get it once a week, tongue sandwich. I would make deposits. I would get change. I would get posters. I would do a thousand things a day. I worked like from 12 to 6, two days a week. I was also a runner at the store. But then once I started getting, like at first, the first two years I was a regular at the store. I didn't travel. And that was done purposely. That was done purposely because I found out that she had to know she could count on you. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, she had to know. So, I remember when I became a regular, that first week, I had comedy work in Northern California, one of the clubs up there, Tommy T's, in, I don't know, one of those, it's close to Oakland or something. Pleasanton, like that. I think. Pleasanton. It's the same place as And I canceled it. I was opening for somebody. I was featuring for somebody. And that first week, she made me a regular. They were like, cancel that shit. You don't want to be gone. And then she, you call her the second week, and she forget who the fuck you are. Right. So I focused on the comedy store for fucking my first three years. Like, I didn't leave till 99 was when I started traveling. And were you still doing the uh, telemarketing for them? No, the telemarketing division closed like three months in. Oh, okay. She got into an argument with the dude, and that was the end of that. And then fucking, I was, I, I always sold cigars. And then when the cigar thing died down at that time, I sold screws and nuts on the phone and bolts. And there was another company on Ivar, and you would have to be there at 5 in the morning. Ooh. So I wouldn't even sleep. I would just go right from the comedy store right there at 5 and sell screws and bolts. And that's when I started faxing different bookers. And I would write, my name is Joey Diaz. I'm a regular at the comedy store. I'm managed by such and such. These are the weeks he got me. These are the weeks I have open. And nobody would reply to me. Nobody would reply to me. Nobody would reply to me. And finally, boom, one booker replied to me. Next thing you know, another one. And every Monday, I would just fax. Like every day, I would fax a different booker from that job. That's when I started faxing resumes. Every fucking day, I would fax 10 resumes to 10 different bookers. And did Mitty tell you to start going on the road? No. Or you just thought no. it was the right time? I just thought it was the right time. I met Joe Rogan like probably 98 was when I met Joe, 97. And I think the first road date I did with him was like 98. But at that time, Chris McGuire opened for Joe full time. You know, when, when Joe first started touring, it was Chris McGuire who opened for him. And then Chris started writing more. 
and then me and Joe became tight again, and that that was that story. So, and then something else happened in 2000 that I forget to mention. Like in '99, I started traveling heavy. When I say heavy, I would disappear for seven months of a shot, come back for a month, do a couple auditions, have a few meetings, and I disappear again. And I was getting funnier and funnier on the road. The comedy store was just carving off the fat. You know what I'm saying? Would you come in and check in every yeah, at the comedy store? Yeah. If I listen, in those days, if I I would if my plane landed at eight, I would call in for a spot. I would have the taxi cab or whoever drop me off at the comedy store, and I put my luggage in the manager's room. Fuck. Like that's the first place I went to when I got off a plane. I couldn't think of not being there. When I became a regular February 19th, from that time on for maybe two years straight, there wasn't a night I missed there. I was there seven nights a week. At one point in the night, I would show up there. Because God forbid you caught a fallout. Because my spots were always late, Lee. I was always 1245, 1215, 115 in the main room. You know what it is to go up at 115 in the main room on a Saturday night? That's perfect in New York. It's a late, this ain't late city here. No, there's not that many people there at 130 now. 40 people, 50 people. But that's how I learned how to rock. She puts you through that. She puts you through a special regimen. Like, that's what I'm saying. She was like a Greg Jackson, but you didn't see it. I didn't see it till later years. I was always very proud of being a comedy store regular. Always. I've always been very proud of that fact. That's something you cannot take away from me. My name is on that wall. You could call me a thief. You could say I'm a felon. You could say whatever the fuck you want. But that's one thing that I really, really earned was my name on that fucking wall. And it meant having my name on that wall meant everything to me. Like, that's it. Even as a, I did something. It proved to me that I did something. Whether I became with it or not, Listen, man, I, I stayed up there as one of her loyal regulars for 10 years straight. I got five spots a week, plus I hosted. And then there's a time in your life when you have to move on, man. You have to decide what you're going to do. I felt I was there all the time, and I had seen what had happened to people who were there all the time. If you notice now, I go to the comedy store, very limited. Did you notice that? Yeah, like once or twice a week, maybe. There's a reason for that. Because I'm scared to go back to that place where I was. That's a long week at the comedy store. What do you think would happen if you didn't? I just don't know. Like, it's just the comedy store. Was, it's one of those places that you have to keep in your life, but keep it distant. Keep it close, but keep it distant at like, the same time. Not that you don't take comedy seriously, but you have different priorities now. You have a family. Yeah. And that's probably one of the reasons why. Let me give some shout-outs here. Beto Duran, Oscar Lopez, Ace of SoCal, Rumpel Foreskin, Tommy Enos, Time Moore, Nicholas Griswold, Kyle Pillay, beautiful little dog you got there. Lenny Gonzalez and Bobby Sharon over there with the Cobra cast and fucking Austin, Texas bitches. This was just, I wanted to do this podcast as a tribute to Mitzi Shaw, man. I felt that I, I just owed her an hour of my fucking time. I owed her more for what she did for me. She was one of those angels I always talk about in life that come into your life and get out of your life. But they change your life forever. And you never know the answer, you know, why they could have this happened. I don't know how I'm a comedy store regular still today, 20 years later. I don't know. But it was like a family to me, like a family had taken me in. Like, I took it seriously, man. Like, to me, it meant the world to be a fucking comedy store regular. And still today, I wear it like a badge of honor. I was made by fucking Mitzi. I wasn't made by no manager and nobody called me in or nothing. No, 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 no. I was, you know, picked by her. I did two showcases. She made me a regular. I was a regular there in less than a month. Can you fucking believe that? Till this day, I still can't get over that, how people are here for years. Even Rogan was an unpaid regular for a while. 
And I mean, I, I know people are gonna say, "Oh, it's just another day." It's on your birthday. That has to be. That has to fuck with you at least once. It changed my life forever, man. Like right there, I knew I was staying. Right there, I knew I had to figure out what I was gonna do with my life. Right there, I knew that I was in the big leagues. I wasn't big time. I was a small fucking fry in a big pond. So I kept my mouth shut. I watched. I listened. She made me follow Paul Mooney for like a year, and that really got me going. Between Paul Mooney, Dom Herrera, and AJ Jamal, I became a comedian, training behind them. They were like my sparring partners, and I lost every fucking night. It was ridiculous. It was fucking ridiculously. I didn't start getting laughs at the store till like 2003. What? 2002 was when I started like really getting the niche of the store. It took oh. me like four years to get the niche of the room. How I lasted those four years, I have no fucking idea. I can't imagine loving a place so much and going there to bomb. I wasn't bombing. I was learning something new every night. You have no idea what it is to go on <coughs> at midnight or at 12.15. That stuff Brody does, that's a different world of comedy. That's a complete different world of comedy. And it is an hour. Huh? And he'll do an hour sometimes. Yeah, it's a different world of comedy at midnight. Think of what somebody's head is at at midnight. What mm -hmm. the fuck were you doing out at midnight? You know, like I would go up every night at 12.45, 10 to 1. Who the fuck is out? Vampires. There would be eight, nine people in the audience. So my first three years of comedy, I basically performed five nights a week for eight or nine people. Every once in a while, there'd be 30 if I was fucking lucky. That's good. And, I mean, how how much of a big deal... You were talking about going and just being at the store, but would the store have had the same appeal if Mitzi wasn't there? Like, I think she was, like, a huge part of it. Well, you know, for years growing up, a lot of you guys don't remember it. It was Evening at the Improv. I, I've heard of it. I'm and that was a show that was on A&E early on. And it was uh, comedians would go on stage and then they would thank fucking, uh, you know, Bud Friedman, thank you. And Bud would sit there with his little monocle and wave and shit. And it was kind of cute. And then you move out here and you realize that that's all bullshit. Those people don't even talk like that. You know what I'm saying? Like you, you see behind the curtain and you start getting negative about it. I didn't feel that way with Mitzi. With Mitzi, we just talked. Like, was she the legend that she was? She saw something, man. A lot of people were there. Sandra Bernhardt, the black chick from The View, with the dread uh, one woman show upstairs. What's her name? Oh, uh, Whoopi? Yeah, Whoopi Goldberg. The comedy store runs deep, guys. This is deep, deep, deep. Sometimes you go down to La Jolla and you look through the yearbooks and you see, like, actors in there. Like Andy Garcia. <coughs> Andy Garcia was part of an improv troupe there on Monday nights. I think, if I'm not wrong, David Letterman was part of the improv group on Monday nights. Like, the biggest night at the comedy store was Monday nights. And Andy Garcia was part of that. Like, I can't tell you how many people went through the comedy store at different phases of their lives. Do you remember when I told you that I don't know if you're going to be a stand-up comic, but I know that this is going to point you in the direction? Right, it's yeah. It's the same thing with the store. Some people got to the store and all of a sudden they went, Err! wait a second, this isn't what I wanted to do. This is not what I want to do. I do not want to follow fucking Whoopi Goldberg every night. I do not want to follow Chris Lee. I do not want to follow Richard Pryor. This is not what I thought. And they just changed careers. Really? Just because of who they're following? No, Lee. I'm just saying that it, but, it, it's a realization of what this is. Right. When you get to the store, after you've been in Chicago for seven, eight years, fighting for your life, doing open mics, and you move out here and you sign with a manager, and you get to the comedy store, and you go up there and you see all these fucking names that you grew up liking, that you grew up watching, that you grew up watching their specials on Comedy Central, that affects people different ways. People go, fuck, 
I'm here. This is a bit too scary for me. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, it, it, it becomes real when you get to that level. Like, this isn't the fucking fucking around level. This isn't you and your buddies in the basement going, someday I'm going to be a comedian at the comedy store. No, this is real now. Now you're following people. Now you're in that fucking mix. I told you that four weeks ago I fucking had to sit one night on the cooler because I had to bring up fucking Martin Lawrence. Like, are you fucking crazy? Like, I've been doing comedy for 27 years, and I've never been blown away. And that night, I know Martin. I did Martin's fucking specials on that network, uh, Stars, in 2003, before anybody was doing stand-up. He signed up with that dude, Doug, and did a, a stand-up show, and I was one of the comedians. I know Martin Lawrence. But that night when I brought him up, and I went to the back, and I, I'm standing there with Rogan and fucking Joe and Mickey Gall and fucking Calvin Gastelman, and here's fucking Martin Lawrence up on stage, and I'm sitting there going, this, state, this place still blows me back 20 years later. You know, that's the magic of the comedy store. It wasn't getting there. It was staying there. That's what she taught me. Getting there was one thing. Staying there for 20 years is a complete other thing. And the only reason why I'm in this, why I have a wife, why I have a daughter, why I have this podcast with you is because of Mitzi Shaw and what she did for me that night on my 34th birthday. So when I talk about people and uh, thinking that this was a catwalk, it wasn't a catwalk for anybody. Just the fact that I got the showcase for that woman in my lifetime. I was buying bars, guys. I went through a fucking diagnostic. I mean, you know, I talked to a prison psychiatrist. And here I am in front of Mitzi Shore showcasing. And then to make it worse, I become a fucking regular. I thank her. I thank her for giving me my wife, my daughter, this podcast. All the things that happened to me through comedy happened to me. Because of the comedy store in Mitzi Shaw. Thank you very much for listening. Tickets for Columbus this week are sold out. But Tempe, I'm coming. The 3rd, the 4th, and the 5th. Let the Mexicans fucking run loose. Anyway, rest in peace, Mitzi Shaw. Thank you very much for giving me the, for showing me the journey of comedy, man. Thank you for letting me into your club, and thank you for teaching me how to become a comedian. Thank you. I want to thank Fuji Sports. Listen, like I said in the beginning of the show, you're a fat fuck. You're thinking of joining jujitsu. You're going to buy the wrong gear. Don't even fuck around. Go right to Fujisports.com right now. Take a look at their line. They got a purple gear. It's like a $99 gear. It's like an off. It's not blue. It's not white. It's not black. That's a great beginner gi. That's a great gi. It's comfortable. Unless the school wants a white gi, then get yourself a fucking separito or an element. An element's a nice starter gi. It's light. It's fucking durable. You can hang on. You A fucking gorilla can hang on my fucking collar and nothing will happen. Go to Fujisports.com if you're a big guy, you're looking for rash cards. Also, JoeyDears.net has big rash cards for you fat fucks also. So we got some fucking rash cards rocking the house for you. Also, I want to give a shout out to I know. First of all, if you like something from Fuji on the checkout press church, bam, and get 10% off because Uncle Joey sent you there. All right. Number two, if you're looking for supplements, you know which way to go. You got to go without it. Just between the shroom tech and the alpha brain and the shroom tech immune right there. You, if you would have taken shroom tech immune, you wouldn't have had the bronchitis. And you would have been smoking dope with three hands. I fucked up. You fucked up. He got away. But anyway, uh, Alpha Brain has a 100% money back guarantee. And you keep the product. That's how much belief they have in their product. So go to honor.com right now and press in church and get 10% off on your way out. And don't forget to look for Aubrey Marcus's book. Go on Amazon, type in Aubrey Marcus. I don't know the name of the fucking book right offhand right now. But I got a copy at the house. I got to read. And I read like the first eight pages. And it was very motivating. So go to uh, Amazon. I think they're selling yeah. the Aubrey Martin book. Aubrey Marcus book. And that's it. And that's that. This podcast was from Mitzi Shorn. Just to let you guys know. 
It's not getting there. It's what you do, what the fuck you get there. You understand me? We'll be back Wednesday. Stay black. Uncle Joey loves you. Have a great week. Fuji Sports, I love you. Honored, I love you. Kick that fucking mule, Lee.